This is the 46th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video provides the first implementation details for caches by discussing the direct mapped cache. The previous video explained what caches are and why they're critical to the performance of modern CPUs. We saw that the instruction memory and data memory elements in the textbook CPU are really caches and ended the video by asking, what data do we put in the cache? Right, so how do we make sure that we have the data in the cache that we're actually going to need? And once it's there, how do we find it? So to see how all this works, let's begin with the simplest cache called a direct map cache. For simplicity, let's suppose this is a one megabyte cache. That means it holds one megabyte of data. For now, let's also suppose that this cache is byte addressable, which means it contains two to the 20 rows, which is just over a million, and that each row holds one byte or eight bits of data. This isn't a typical cache configuration. I'm just using it for now so that our initial explanation is as simple as I can make it. So again, to keep the explanation a little simpler, view this cache as a huge register file. The actual implementation would be a little different, but that doesn't really matter. So we're gonna go with this simpler mental model, the one you're more familiar with to help you understand how the cache works. So think of each row as a register that's numbered from zero all the way up to two to the 20 minus one. The user can specify the desired byte by placing the row number on a 20-bit input called the index. Think of the input as an index to an array containing two to the 20 elements. So just like a register file, this index is the selector to a big two to the 20 to one mux that returns the data in the requested row. So let's see how we build this into the CPU. Imagine your code has executed a load byte instruction that asks for the byte at RAM address ABCD1234. Now, in order to keep the cache as fast and as small as possible, we don't want to have to check each location. We don't want to be looking through all 1 million bytes to see if the one we want is there. And as a quick reminder, because this cache is hardware and not software, checking every location is primarily a size problem, not a speed problem. We'll come back to that in another video. In any case, we need a way of computing where the data is rather than searching for it. In other words, we need a function that will take as input a 32-bit memory address, which is provided by the loader store instruction, and then return a 20-bit index telling us the location of the data in the cache. Since the cache is an important part of the CPU's critical path, we want this function to be as fast as possible. So what's the fastest possible algorithm for turning 32 bits into 20? For now, don't worry about quality. Just come up with something stupidly fast. Well, the fastest thing we can do is just throw out 12 bits. In particular, we'll throw out the 12 most significant bits and keep the least significant 20. Now that probably sounds way too simple, but it actually works. And it really is the fastest possible method for turning 32 bits into 20 because it literally takes no time at all. There's no computation, we're just grabbing bits out of a bundle. So this type of cache where the location of data is determined by this hash function is called a direct mapped cache. Each memory location is directly mapped to a single location in the cache. In the case shown here, memory address ABCD1234 is mapped to cache index D1234. That means the data for ABCD1234 is either in this spot in the cache or it's not in the cache at all you won't ever find the data for ABCD1234 in any other row. But wait, how do we know if index D1234 in the cache contains the data we're looking for? Because all addresses ending with D1234 map to the same place in the cache. That means the data at index D1234 could have come from any of these addresses. So it turns out that not only do we need to store the data, but we also need to keep track of where that data came from. So this new version of the cache stores more information. It not only stores the data itself, but also the address of that data in RAM, where it came from. In addition, we added a one bit valid column that tells us whether that row contains any useful data at all. We need this because normally when you first boot up a CPU, memory elements can get filled with random values. 
So we need to distinguish from a row actually having the right data from a row that just happens to have the right random bits after a boot. So what we do is we make sure that this column is filled with zeros when the machine first boots up. You'll see why this is helpful in a minute. Okay, so now let's walk through the operation of the cache. So assume the machine is freshly booted, so all the valid bits are shown here. All the other data in the cache is unreliable. Now, suppose the first memory request is for location A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4. The index for this memory address is D1234. So the data for this request is either in the highlighted row or it's not in the cache at all. The valid bit on this row is zero, which means the row doesn't contain any valid data at all, which of course implies it doesn't contain the data we're looking for. The MUX returns all of the bits in the row, including the valid bit. Those bits are unbundled and the valid bit is sent to the AND gate where it causes the hit output to be zero. Placing a zero on this hit output tells the CPU that the cache doesn't have the requested data. In response, the CPU will fetch the data from RAM and place it in the cache. Right? This is analogous to you going to the refrigerator, not finding what you want, so you go to the store and buy it. And of course, if you don't eat it right then, you'll put it in the fridge so you have it later. So not only is this data placed in the cache, but so is the address that that data came from. And now that we've explicitly set some data in that line of the cache, we'll turn the valid bit from a zero to a one. The next time an instruction requests address A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4, the index again identifies row D1234. This time the valid bit is a 1. So that 1 is sent through the MUX with the other bits in the row, unbundled, and sent to the AND gate. At the same time, the address field is unbundled and sent to the equality subcircuit. In this case, that address value is equal to the address requested. So the hit output is 1. When the CPU sees this hit output of 1, it knows that the data output contains the requested data, so the program is able to continue without waiting for a trip to RAM. When we write programs, we naturally tend to refer to the same data repeatedly. So, with high probability, the next few memory accesses with an index of D1234 will be to ABCD1234. All of these requests are cache hits. At some point, however, the program that's running will move to another section of the code. And when it does, let's suppose it asks for memory address 987D1234. Notice that this address also has an index of D1234. As before, the valid bit is 1 because there's valid data in that row of the cache. That valid bit will be unbundled and sent to the AND gate. And at the same time, the address value will be unbundled and sent to the equality circuit but this time the address stored in the cache doesn't match the address we've requested. As a result, the equality subcircuit will return false, causing the hit output to be false. Since the hit output is false, the CPU doesn't use the data. It shouldn't, it's not the data that we've requested. Instead, the CPU will make a request to RAM to get the data it wants, and when that data comes back, it will update the cache row with the requested data and it will also update the address field to show which data is currently in the cache. So at this point, you've seen the basic operation of a direct map cache. When you want data from RAM, compute which row in the cache the data should be in, and then check to see if the address of the data at that row matches the address of the data you're requesting. If it does, you can immediately return the data and save a bus trip to RAM. If the two addresses don't match, then you need to make that bus trip to RAM, provide the requested data to the instruction, and also save both the data and the address in the cache for the next time that address is requested. But there's one glaring inefficiency in this direct map cache as I've described it here. Can you see it? If not, do this. Pretend we've been running a program for a while, and the cache is mostly loaded with data from all over the address space. Do you see any redundancies in this cache's address column? Well, notice that the last five bits of each address are equal to that row's index. Of course, this isn't surprising because we specifically placed the addresses in the row based on those last five bits. But this choice of placement means that we don't need to store these bits in the cache. When we need that information, we can just refer to the index. Therefore, we can shrink the cache to hold only the first 12 bits of the address. 
Once we make this change, however, we can't call this column an address column anymore because it doesn't contain the complete address. Instead, we call it the tag. Everything still works the same as before, except we're only storing 12 bits of the address in the cache, which means that the equality subcircuit is only comparing 12 bits. Specifically, it compares the 12-bit tag stored in the cache to the first 12 bits of the requested address. So this diagram here that uses the tag is actually how you would implement a direct map cache. The diagrams earlier in the video included the full address because I thought it might initially make it easier to understand the cache when you saw the whole address in there rather than just the tag. And actually, I'm going to explain a little bit more about the tag. Because from this initial explanation, you may be tempted to look at the tag as bits that are left over after we remove the index. But there's something more important going on. And I want to make sure you understand what it is. In mathematics, there's a concept called the pigeonhole principle that states if you have more pigeons than pigeonholes, then some hole will have more than one pigeon. So our 4 gigabyte address space with a 1 megabyte cache is like having 4 billion pigeons and only 1 million pigeonholes there will necessarily be multiple pigeons, that is memory addresses, competing for each pigeonhole, competing for each space in the cache. To be precise, because each memory address is assigned exactly one location in the cache, in this example, each pigeonhole has exactly 2 to the 12 pigeons assigned to it. That number, of course, depends on the cache size. So the tag is, in some sense, a name tag. Its job is to identify which pigeon is currently occupying a particular hole or in other words, which memory address is currently occupying a particular line in the cache. And because each hole has only 2 to the 12 pigeons assigned to it, we only need 12 bits to identify that pigeon, or that memory address if you prefer. We don't need all 32 bits because we don't need to identify memory addresses or pigeons that are assigned to other places in the cache. The tag is this 12-bit identifier used to identify which of 2 to the 12 possible memory addresses is currently housed in a particular cache line. So contrary to how the tag tends to get described, it isn't really a leftover, but rather a reflection of how many addresses are assigned to each spot in the cache. Let me use one more analogy. Suppose you go to a convention at a hotel that has a policy of assigning rooms based on your last name. In particular, if your last name is Smith, your room will be on the first floor. If your last name is Jones, your room will be on the second floor. And if your last name is Brown, you'll be on the third floor. At the convention hall, name tags need both first and last names because everybody's together in one place. If you see a George, you won't know if it's George Smith, George Jones, or George Brown. However, once you get to the hotel, the name tag needs only a first name. If you see a George and you're on the first floor, you know it must be George Smith. If you see a George on the second floor, you know it must be George Jones. In the context of a cache, a memory address's tag is its first name. And the cache is like our strange hotel. When the memory address is in the cache and sorted by index, we only need to see its first name, that is, its tag, to uniquely identify it. We only need both a first name and a last name, write the complete memory address, when referencing an address with respect to the entire memory space. There's one more loose end I want to tie up. I want to show the reasoning for using the least significant bits of the memory address for the index instead of the most significant bits, or at least for this example. The next video will introduce an offset, which will slide the index bits to the left just a little. So it turns out that when writing programs, data that's used at about the same time tends to be assigned addresses that are near each other in RAM. This is a principle called spatial locality. For example, suppose a function has four local variables, say x, y, z, and w. These four variables will all be accessed at about the same time, right? the time during which the function is executing. Because we place local variables on the stack, their memory addresses will also be very near each other. So let's say these variables are characters, meaning they only need one byte, and they get assigned to memory addresses a, b, c, d, 1, 2, 3, 4 through a, b, c, d, 1, 2, 3, 7. Notice what happens when we define the index to be the least significant 20 bits of the address. Because the addresses for x through w are all near each other, the lower five bits of each address differ, which means they're assigned to different rows in the cache. As a result, all four variables can coexist in the cache at the same time, which means the CPU has fast access to all four of them. 
Now, there are other addresses that also map to these locations, like FFFD1234 and 123D1234. But because these addresses are far away, they're not likely to be in use at the same time as XYZ and W. Therefore, they probably won't be competing for space in the cache. In other words, there isn't likely to be a load or a store instruction accessing those particular addresses. In contrast, look what happens if we instead use the most significant 20 bits of the address as the index. In this case, the addresses that are close together are all mapped to the same line in the cache, which means only one of these four variables can be stored in the cache at any one time. This is disastrous for performance, because most if not all of the accesses to these variables will be cache misses as they keep kicking each other out of the cache. And while this is going on, addresses like FFFD1234 and 123D1234 will be mapped to different lines of the cache that go completely unused because the function isn't asking for data at those locations. So to make a long story short, we use the least significant bits for the index because doing so is more likely to put data being used at the same time on different lines in the cache where it won't conflict. Now, there's still a lot more to discuss about caches. But for right now, you should know that a direct map cache assigns each memory address to a specific line in the cache. We call this the index. The cache must also store the unique portion of the address currently occupying each cache line. This is called the tag. When a CPU requests data, we first have to check to see if that data is in the cache. To do this, we use the index to access the cache line assigned to the particular memory address. We then verify that the tag stored on that line matches the tag of the requested address. If the valid bit is a 1 and the tags match, we call this a cache hit and return the requested data. If either the valid bit is 0 or the tags don't match, we call this a cache miss, and then we have to pause and fetch the data from RAM and put it in the cache. These are the fundamental aspects of cache operation. The next several videos will look at small modifications to this general design that either improve cache performance or improve its efficiency.